So my students are very happy. Uh, we have uh, a similar project like uh, Tzvi talked about, but we are also actually using the same sort of an approach, making trans transgenic uh, uh, plants in order to control the citrus weevil. Now, <clears throat> the citrus weevil, like uh, the prunus, uh, uh, is also uh, attacking the, uh, the leaves of, the, uh, of uh, citrus. The larvae actually eat the, uh, <clears throat> the roots, as you can see here, and this is what happened to the tree. The tree just shriveled. So we had uh, an expression in English, a uh, three-legged approach or three, or, 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 or three ways of doing something. So we actually looked at, at three different approaches, using bacillus uh, toxins, block the digestive po uh, proteolytic enzymes, and RNA inhibition. We're trying to uh, mix everything because, uh, you know, if you, go, if you go boxing, you know, one punch doesn't do it. But if you have a combination, sometimes you're lucky. The other guy doesn't deck you first. So the first, so the first thing we wanted to do is to find out about a suitable uh, bacillus toxin. So we looked to identify Bt toxins against the purpose uh, wood weevil. We want to develop a synthetic genes for these things. We want to construct transgenic uh, model plants and then replicate the transgenic work and work with citrus uh, rootstock. Okay, so how do you go about it? So like Tzvi said, first of all, you take some <clears throat> of these concoctions that you do a survey, you, uh, you suspend them in a food, you mix it together. In, in this case, we put it on the lid, on the top of the lid there, and we turn the lid around. We put the larvae neonate directly, <coughs> excuse me, into the tube, as you can see here. <coughs> we fix the lid. We turn the tube, and we look to see if the larvae dies. OK, so we did that, and then we did all the uh, probit analysis with all the toxins that we have, and we isolated one toxin, a B21582. And this is the sequence. And actually, we found out that that toxin actually belongs to good old Monsanto, the good old boys. You know, Anyway, we're going to use it anyway. We don't care. Uh, let them go after the government. And uh, the problem is, is that the DNA sequence is optimized to expression in bacterium, and we have to change it. Now, this is not a BTI toxin in the sense that it is the uh, big cry toxin. This is actually looks like a sick toxin. Now, what we did was, uh, this is the original sequence, <clears throat> and this is the optimization. All the, uh, all the capital letters are the ones that we optimize in order to have it uh, expressed in plants. And what we did, we did a transformation. Very easy to do if you know what you're doing. Uh, you take an agro agrobacterium culture. You cut your leaves so they are exposed. You throw them into a test tube or into a petri dish. And then you uh, let, let it uh, you do a selection transformation with antibiotics. And then you have a, uh, <coughs> a regeneration. You put all the hormones and you get a plant. OK, and that's the way all the, these are our, all the steps, how they look, the callus, the small plantlets, and then the, uh, the plant itself. And we did it in alfalfa. And why we did it in alfalfa? Because, because the citrus weevil loves alfalfa. They eat the leaves and they eat the roots. Now, the next thing is to test it. So we had some transgenic plants, as you can see here. We threw some larvae directly into the pots there, and we, uh, <clears throat> and we tested to see what happens, and that what happens. The one that were transgenic, you can see they're really nice and healthy. The one that were not transgenic, they're all dying. You can barely see them. And if you pull out the, uh, the whole plant from the ground, and it's easy to work with alfalfa, you don't need a tractor to pull out the tree, and you can see that all the BT, you know, the BT expressed, all the uh, roots are there, the one that is the wild type, you know, the roots are not there. And again, another example here. <clears throat> uh, the next thing we knew is that these insects have uh, proteolytic enzymes. 
Uh, I had a, uh, a graduate student, she got a, a master's degree, and we actually found there was a, cat a catepsin, and there's also a trypsin in the gut. So we wanted to actually block these things. This is our next step, proteolytic enzyme. So we characterize the enzymes. Uh, we develop a, 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 a selective strategy to stop the enzymatic activity. And this is uh, actually how the gut looks like. This is the top here is the larvae gut, and the bottom is the adult gut. And as you can see, the foregut, it looks here, is right there. <clears throat> the anterior midgut is this region. The uh, posterior midgut is here. And the hindgut is right there. So we study both, uh, both guts. And what we did was we, we prepared the CD in a library. I'm not going to go how to make it. I'm pretty sure a lot of people here know better than me. You, you, take the, you isolate RNA. <clears throat> you do a cDNA synthesis. You clone it into vectors. And then you sequence it. And if you do that, you can do all the genomics. And we have a huge lab there in the USDA, a whole floor just devoted for genomics. And there was no problem. It didn't cost us any money, you know. Thanks for, the, uh, for Uncle Sam money, you know. And we got all the, we found out that the proteases was the, the most amount of proteins that are in, actually in the transcript. These here are RNA, are ribosomal RNA that do not count. But the most transcript is right here, the proteases. So we knew that we are on the right track. Well, the next thing we wanted to know, which are the important proteases? And we found out that the important proteases are, <clears throat> and, and the numbers are actually represent how many times we did the sequencing for each one. So the primary protease in the larvae were catepsin L and trypsin. And that was actually done in my lab by my graduate student. And we also found out from the catepsin that the uh, DCL, DCL1 uh, sequence is actually has 60%, and the rest 30% is with the, with the other <coughs> DCL9 to, uh, to DCL4. So we knew exactly which uh, proteins are there. And the next thing we wanted to know is where are the transcripts are in abundance to find out where are these enzymes synthesized. I share that the gut is actually stretched very long, and there are certain regions there. And indeed, we found out that the catepsins are actually in the foregut. All the catepsin, and this is the one that we showed the, the most amount, is actually DC, uh, the DCL1 uh, is actually found in the foregut. And as you can see here, in the foregut, that's where all the catepsins are synthesized, most of them. <coughs> and this actually shows a, a, uh, a comparison between the catepsins and the trypsin and the pH, the different pH, as you know. The gut, the gut has to have different pH because serin proteases need a, a basic pH, while catepsins need acidic pH. It's the nature of the of the beast. So indeed, the catepsin has the uh, acidic pH, as you can see here. This is the pH, and the uh, trypsins are maximized in the uh, uh, in the region, the post, <coughs> the. Uh, the uh, uh, the posterior midgut uh, pH is actually basic. And chymotrypsin actually spreads throughout the whole thing, but doesn't amount to very much. Now, in summary, uh, proteases are abundant, uh, <coughs> are the most abundant messenger RNA. The catepsin are uh, neither acidic, while the total trypsins are found in the posterior midgut, they are basic. Now, we wanted to, OK, so you know the, all these things, so that's wonderful. But what do you do with that? You want to block it. Because if you block it, you starve them. Like we saw with the mosquitoes, the TMOF, you starve them, you die, you know, they die, they become abnormal, you know, and hence there is the death. So what we did, we developed a selective strategy to stop enzymatic activity. So what do you do? Well, we wanted to block trypsin activity and block catepsin activity. Well, block trypsin activity. We had already the, the silver bullet. We had TMOF. TMOF also work on this insect. However, to block a tepsin activity, that's where the genomics came into, in, into hand. So this is actually the, the, uh, the weevil trypsin. This is a 3D that I was uh, actually built in my lab. And in the, this collaboration, Professor De Luf in, in Belgium with the uh, uh, X-ray uh, uh, diffraction department over there. So this is the C terminal. <laughs> this is the N terminal. Uh, this is the uh, catalytic triad, you know. The trypsin has three amino acids, 
that they actually hold the protein before they chew it up. So here are the three proteins that actually the proteins is bound to. It's the aspartic acid, is the histidine, is the serine, and actually that enzyme is then act is, is actually anchored right there between these amino acids and then get chopped. And the uh, and the specific in the specific uh, uh, pocket that also has some interaction is right there. So this is the uh, the catepsin, and the next thing we did was we actually uh, <coughs> genetically engineer the uh, uh <coughs> I'm sorry uh, genetically engineer uh, alfalfa as you can see here. These are plants that uh, did not uh, stand the uh, uh, the canamycin because they were not did not have the gene. And indeed, if you look at these plants, the alfalfa is TMOF versus the wild wildlife <coughs> wild type alfalfa. They all look similar. The uh, the engineering was very very good. And we did also the uh, northern uh, the northern just to show where the transpic are in each in each plant. Some people do it by qPCR. We just did it these northerns here. And this is the uh, TMRF where the TMRF transcript is supposed to run. You see, uh, C9 is not so good because the transcript is not that, that strong, but C12 and, is, and D38 is the same way. But C12 and uh, D25 is, is much, are much better plants. And these are the uh, our controls. And when we did that, <coughs> we wanted to find out uh, what inhibition we get. And we got inhibition from 45% to, uh, of course, the uh, wild type did not give us any inhibition to 35%. Okay, on these plants, we didn't, we didn't check all the plants. Now, let's just go and talk about the catepsins. The catepsins are enzymes that are, are actually large enzymes that has uh, three regions. There is a pre, there is a pre, pro, and the mature catepsin. So the enzyme is actually cut here and become mature uh, catepsin. Otherwise, it's not active. Now, also, uh, people know about the catepsin inhibitors, specific catepsin inhibitor. There is in, Bob, in Bombix mori, in mammalian, the mammalian system is a P41, and in the purpose abbreviations, we also found the, uh, uh, an inhibitor that actually is a modulator in a way. And what happens is that the mature catepsin, the pro region actually is actually like a chaperone, while the catepsin L inhibitor uh, region acts like an enzyme modulator. And, I, and I'll explain to you briefly why it acts like an enzyme modulator. Now, here is, a, is an X-ray diffraction model of the uh, mammalian uh, catepsin. I did that because I didn't have the other results that I'm going to show you. So it shows you the interaction between P41 and the, and the catepsin. So the P41 sits on the top here. The, uh, the binding of the substrate is right there. Here's the catepsin. The binding of the substrate here, it prevents the substrate from coming here, and then there is no, uh, uh, there's no, uh, a, <coughs> uh, there's no attack by the enzyme on the substrate. Now, we found out that we have a cysteine protease inhibitor that was, was done in my lab, and if you actually express it and, and uh, purify it, and you are inc incubated with catepsin, with the insect catepsin, you find out that increased amount up to around 140, 30 nanograms gives you around 80, 83% inhibition. And how does it work? I'm just making everything short. Uh, in the, in the, the where the gut has a pH between three to four, that particular, uh, that particular uh, inhibitor does not bind. But when the pH goes to one uh, higher, around eight basic, that inhibitor then just actually bound. And the reason they do that is because they want to conserve the structure of the enzyme. If the enzyme breaks, that synthesizes another enzyme. So it's a very, very smart system by the, by the insect to conserve energy and to use the enzyme time and time again. Now, the question is, you said to me, yeah, the mammalian people did this in the medical school, but what about you? What about your enzyme? You know, you're just looking in the sky and, ha and hope that the thing ha happens to you too. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just before I came here, we did modeling, and here it is, the uh, CPI-1 and the, our catepsin, and you can see that the CPI-1 is sitting right there in the groove. As you can see here, the tail is sitting right there in the groove, CPI-1, catepsin L, right there where the, where the substrate bind, and this little tail just prevents it. And if you look even closer, 
to the CPI1. You see there are some amino acids that if you do some mutagenesis here, you can actually bind them irreversibly and you can actually stop it directly. So if you express it in a plant, it will actually bind to the enzyme in the insect's gut and, and voila, just kill it. It would not come back. Okay, so that is the, that is the whole idea. So the conclusion is that uh, there are uh, TMOF can control and also uh, we ex express it in, in, al in alfalfa <coughs> and we have also catepsin uh, L inhibitor and to improve the function we actually do some mutagenesis and express that in a plant in order to bind irreversibly to the, uh, to the enzyme. Okay, the last one and only, only three more slides so you'll have some more time. Uh, the, the last slide is the RNAi approach. Everybody talks about RNA, RNAi. RNAi is very specific because you can actually target it and model it directly to a plant. So the RNA bind, uh, your RNA bind to a specific gene on the insect. Usually, most of the time, because they have to take it orally, you want to target genes that are sitting inside the gut because that is where the RNAi is going to come in first. So that's what we did. We identified target genes that are sitting in the gut we constructed double-stranded RNA uh, <clears throat> matching target genes, and we did some feeding. And this is uh, the mechanism of double-stranded RNA. You have a double-stranded RNA that is actually uh, <clears throat> uh, chopped by dicer to chains of 20 to 24 uh, uh, double-stranded cha uh, RNA chains, bind to risk, and then you get a single uh, uh, RNA and uh, bound to risk, and that is then bound to a, another message RNA, actually breaks down the message RNA, and that, uh, that's the way it actually destroys it. And so we wanted to identify target genes and feed them to the insects. So what we did was uh, we told genes that express in the digestive tract, like I said, those genes were alpha tubulin, uh, chitin modifying enzyme, and catepsin L. They all, uh, they all expressed there and we made double cell RNA to them. And how we did it, we did it on both sides of the coding region. We, did on, on, uh, we took a 300 base pairs region at the beginning and at the end of the gene, of the, of the transcript, and we, uh, we actually then expressed them and we fed them to the insect. And you do that, and that's my last slide. Uh, when you do that, you find out that the chitin uh, associate protein A was the best, and the next one was actually catepsin L. You always have some background that you don't have even to feed them and you get some mortality because these insects are so, are so small. However, however, you can see that the, actually these, these are, the best, uh, are the best gene. So now the next thing we have to do is to actually express them in, in, uh, in a woodstock and, or in alfalfa and, uh, and try to see if they, are, if they are very selective and kill the insect. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I had to uh, rush a little bit. <laughs> so I guess by this time everybody fell asleep, so thank you. <laughs> uh, what is the uh, time frame for developing the system? Uh, 